Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is your host, Mike Badger, with another episode of Pastured Poultry Talk, and this is episode number 52. Uh, I want to catch you up today a little bit about what's going on, uh, where we've been, where we're going. Uh, there's been a little silence. I apologize for that. You know, we'll talk a little bit about that today, maybe the, the whole work-life balance thing and, and, and making time for the things that, that matter. Um, and I, I, I want it to be clear that this podcast matters. Um, and we're, we're turning that corner. I, I hope so what we, what I'm going to do before we jump into, to the next wave of episodes that I have pub ready to publish. And we, we will get those episodes out here. They're going to be in editing, uh, soon after you hear my voice, but we have uh, a, a month's worth of shows lined up and with, with more in the works. So I realized a couple things here as, as I was going through the last, few months of the summer here and really the kind of the last half year I would even say you know these my, my downloads the downloads for this show you listeners are are finding the show even though I haven't been a regular episode poster um I've been bad all right I've been done the number one way to destroy your your market your audience um your customer list if you're selling chickens or eggs is to uh not talk to them so guilty 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 as charged and you know, there's been some activity a little bit here, a couple of posts now and then in the Facebook group, which is uh, growing also by the day. More and more people are popping in there. So we're looking to, to get that um, group to be used as, a, as a, a show discussion. I want you guys to be able to go in there and recommend guests. You know, what do you want to hear about? Who do you want to hear from? And if you do that, and if I get a recommendation and your recommendation comes on the show and talks with us, you know, we'll give you the opportunity to ask a question or two of that guest of your own choosing. And, uh, you know, obviously I have some control, but generally speaking, <laughs> I can't imagine you'd ask anything too crazy, right? So, um, you'll, you'll get to, get to contribute, um, and, and find an, an answer. Cause my, my questions may all always line up with yours. And I'm sure after we talked with people, you always have an issue or not an issue, but a, a question that, that is unanswered. And, and, you know, that's good in, in some ways, cause there's, there's more to talk about. Right. Um, I realized some other things people, I found some not, not widespread, I don't think, but I, I found, found instances where people were, were using show content as a to, to write articles, you know, not just drawing a quote, but like actually writing an article about an episode of the show, posting it, um, and, and getting paid for that work. And that struck me as like, holy cow, you know, when, when do I get paid for this? But, um, um, I'm, you know, that was not, not, not anything bad there. Just, uh, just one of those aha moments like, okay, that's interesting. Right. So you put it in your, your, your back pocket and you move on. Um, and I'm starting to see other podcast kind of take up the the call to arms to talk about pastured poultry talk uh, we're not going to go through them right now you guys can probably find them you know who they are um you know there's still not a, a a big representation of of pastured poultry talk in podcasts and remember this show was started specifically because there wasn't a good representation of pastured poultry in the podcast space um i still think there's lots of room and there's still a, a good opportunity for pasture poultry to, to take over what people think about chicken and turkeys and layers and ducks and geese when they hit the podcast airways. Um, so I also, <laughs> one of the things that, that happened was there's a gentleman, Dave Lehman, um, I met when I was at uh, an event here just a couple months ago, um, back in, you know, midsummer, I think it was, uh, I lose track of the time already, but it, it was, it was end of July, I believe was the date. Um, anyway, family days on the farm down in, in Lancaster County. It's, um, uh, an annual event they have down there where they bring people into the farm, have a big powwow party. It's, uh, usually Amish sponsored. Um, but I took a, a friend, a good friend down his name's Eli Reif. He was going to do a panel on smoking Turkey and um value added turkey and and i was going to help him with that you know provide some commentary and stuff but it was his show i was his driver and uh so right before his speaking slot there was supposed to be a panel on turkey discussion well two of their turkey presenters didn't show up so i got to sit on a, in, a, <laughs> in on a turkey uh 
raising panel and answer questions um, from the crowd on how to raise turkeys, which was really, really awesome. Uh, didn't plan on it, just kind of happened on the fly. But in that process, I met one of our listeners, uh, Dave, who was, you know, hey, when do you, I hope there's more episodes coming. And, and yes, Dave, there's more episodes coming. And for everybody who asked me that question, and I, and then your reminders are the reason that we're, we're still in that show that, that, um, uh, we're, we're still pushing shows out here is is when I see you guys I still hear the need I still hear that you're you're wanting to hear from from other producers in the community you want to you want to get some ideas about how to push this pasture poultry thing forward in your context so you know that's where we're at and that's what we're doing and it's very inspirational I love to hear from you guys again you can reach out to me directly it's Mike at pasturepoultrytalk.com or we have that Facebook group I recommend you go check it out um, because that's the place where I'm going to use to solicit feedback. Other than, you know, the, the sound of my voice right here, that's where I'm going to go when I, when I need to do show prep for, for next month or eight episodes from now, or if I want to run a series, I'm going in there and I want your feedback. So participation, being available to that, that question, it will get you, you know, will get you involved a little bit more. So what have I been doing? Um, just kind of explain that. We'll talk a little bit of what I'm what I'm doing. I'm going to talk a little bit about what my my poultry has been like this summer. But I also, as we as we kick this this show around the around the fifty and we head to a hundred, I thought it'd be good to actually just spend an episode and and talk about how pasture poultry set me free. And so that's where we're going to spend a little bit of our time today. Is just kind of have we're going to hear Mike's story. We never got that. Um, and in one episode, if you've been with APA, if you've been with me, if you've heard me talk, if you've, uh, listened to this episode, this, this podcast for the last 51 episodes, you can piece a lot of things together, but I want to unequivocally give you my story and how pastured poultry has been liberating to me and my family. And I think when I think about that, that is a story that I, I want to resonate, um, because that same kind of story, using pastured poultry as the as the um, path to freedom, is common across farms everywhere, across the U.S., you know, across the world, really. Um, taking control of your food, taking control of your destiny, realizing there's more to life than just uh, driving down the road to an office cubicle somewhere, and 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 how that freedom looks is different for everybody, and that's. That's part of what we want to do on this show is celebrate those differences, celebrate that freedom and get you to wherever you are now, to wherever you want to be. And, you know, that's a, that's a pretty heady journey, but we're going to get there. Um, so I've also uh, been hanging out this summer with, with Cameron, my son, Cameron. He just went back to school. Uh, we tried hens and rabbits and flowers and a lot of hectic craziness this summer. Um, so, you know, learning, learning how to, to get him together and um, get him interested and, and involved daily with some some animals and some chores and some some activity uh, and still maintain all my other sanity and, and work that I need to do uh, kind of ties up a lot of the summer. So it's fitting that this episode is going to launch, you know, days after that he's going back to school. Um, it, it's given me some more structured work time, if you will. Um, I don't mind obviously the the time with him it's been great but it's also you know as a nine-year-old he has needs too and uh sometimes podcasting is not one of those needs um although if i was making minecraft videos he'd probably be all about it but uh anyway so one of the other things that i've been doing here in the last several months and this will bear just a quick mention is i've been collaborating on some content now the one thing that i'm really well i'm actually i'm excited about a couple different things but the first one of them is I took it upon myself, not took it upon myself, but I was, I teamed up with somebody to edit their book, to update their, their pasture poultry book. Um, and we're going to, we're going to release those details. I can't, I don't want to jump the shark here and get out of in front of my skis, but there'll be more information about that coming soon. So that was a really cool undertaking. It was a little bit more than I bargained for, uh, from a, from a budget I underestimated, where I was getting into, but you know, that's just the nature of the beast sometimes. Um, but I'm excited for when that book is ready to go. And I will let everybody know here when that is. 
Um, I also worked on two different video projects this summer. One of them was with an organization that I work don't I don't work for, but I serve on their board. It's the Pennsylvania Grazing Lands Coalition, and you know they're primarily grazers. But they're a couple of years ago they approached me uh, with an interest in pastured poultry because they realize a lot of their 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 grazers are also raising poultry or could use poultry as a diversification in their farm. So I'm I'm represented on the board. I represent pastured poultry. You know we're in Pennsylvania, but we're plugged into the national uh, coalition. So we, we have a video that we filmed earlier in the summer that's in production right now, uh, editing, I guess you would you would say. So I, I, I was heavily involved with, with forming the narrative of, of that video and giving it scope and depth and making sure it accurately represented pasture poultry. Uh, did the shoot with a videographer and we're waiting to see the results of that. We'll share it. Also working on a video with APA, same kind of deal. Um, I don't get screen time in that one. I don't get even voice credit, but you know, I was behind the scenes getting the the you know the direction, the the narrative in place so that our farms that were filmed could could know what they were expecting. Our videographer, who was absolutely fantastic, and we'll be more hearing more about that videographer as that video becomes ready to to hit the mainstream. Uh, it's going to be an awesome video. I've never, you know, this is one of those things where sometimes you're, you're going to have, uh, you're going to, you're going to blow the doors off expectations. So this would be a pasture poultry video you've not seen anywhere else. And I can't wait to share that with you. And at, I just, I won't say any more about it. Um, look for those projects coming up very, very soon. Um, I had a hand in some degree in, in all of them. And the, um, one of the other things I did was kind of fun. Not really, uh, you know, after talking about the other two things, this is kind of a letdown. But I, I posted a couple videos at pasturepoultrytalk.com, which is the show's website. If you go there, there's a menu called Kitchen. So this is my my uh, spot for the pasture poultry kitchen, as I like to call it. And I have just a couple videos. I think there's three right now. One's cutting a chicken in half with a knife. Uh, one is splotchcocking a chicken. And I think the other one is, is boning out the uh, boneless breasts, um, which you can find pretty much anywhere. But cutting a chicken in half with a knife is, is pretty unique. Um, splotch cocking, I just like to say the word, but it's a really cool way to, to cook a chicken. And that's one of the things I want to focus on. And I will see how that plays out with pasture poultry talk is is that kitchen aspect of, of pasture poultry um, and, and really kind of <clears throat> the value added piece of it and what we how we as producers, how you as farmers, direct marketing farmers, are able to use that information. Um, I still think that there's a lot of challenges with farmers not knowing how to prepare their food, or or, or even let me back, let me just back that up a little bit. The the marketer, whether that's the farmer or not, but the marketer, the person selling the product, I think does a whole lot better if that person is able to talk about the chicken beyond. <laughs> this the transaction you know what happens to it what happens to that chicken what happened to that egg what happened to that turkey after it leaves your hand and goes to the your your customer's kitchen um you know in a lot of cases that is the farmer and that's a that's a that's an opportunity right there i think there's a there's a greater opportunity for for us as a community to fill that gap and h- help people use it use our product effectively, you know, give them some confidence. So pasture poultry kitchen, that's just a, an introductory couple videos that I actually filmed for a conference that I was speaking at. I didn't use the video. I used some of the images, but I thought, Hey, I had these cool videos. Might as well put them up. Um, so that's what I've been doing in, in a content space here. The last, the last few months, uh, I would say that one of the, the, um, uh, how should I say the as I, as I look around and, and look to where I'm going, this idea, this, this collaboration, especially with the, with like the, the, um, editing of the book, the, the, the publishing of, of another person's book another expert's knowledge and packaging it up in a way that's ready to be consumed by others, whether that might be a book, a video, or even like a, some course or something like that. 
You know, I'm a technical writer at heart. That stuff gets me jazzed. I love to figure out the, the how it works so that I can understand how to teach it to you so that I can not only show you how to do it, but how to understand it. And that's, to me, if we can understand it, the you're, you're miles ahead of the game. But anyway, ready to collaborate in, in those kinds of issues. That's where, that's, that's a direction that I'm, I'm going off in. Um, and we'll use this podcast as the, as the base station for, for a lot of that stuff. So there's a lot of work, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, in addition to the, the normal stuff that I, I do with, with APA and my, my equipment business and, and things like that, and just being a dad, a, a parent, a, a father, um, a wife, or I'm sorry, hey, I'm the, uh, actually, I'm a husband. I think I know those, the difference. Um, you know, a husband to my wife. And so I, I haven't really been raising a lot of birds. You know, I still have some Beltsvilles. They're growing out. Um, the turkeys, that is, Beltsville small whites. This year, I had an opportunity to raise broilers. And I was only going to raise enough broilers for family plus to sell, um, you know, in one batch. And it's kind of like the thing you do. If I'm going to raise 50 for myself, I'll raise 100 total, you know, that kind of thing. And and make sure that I earn a little bit of cash on it and I get it. Um, I, I get a little bit of cash and I get, you know, my stuff paid for essentially, right? So one of the, and, and one of the things that's happened with my, pastured poultry over the last few years is the processing business when I when we did the processing business that took priority it really squashed the opportunity to, to direct market the poultry but then I also so I didn't keep up with that customer list right so I have a couple customers that I sell to still and they buy stuff and, and everybody's happy um, but then I've along the way I've also implemented different changes that further segregate my my pool you know further limit it right so i i go from you know unknown quote unquote non-gmo feed to you know, to an organic feed now i went to a different organic feed which is a little bit more expensive and i changed my bird type and you know so that all those things have an impact on on who my customer ultimately will be because you know i'm 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 making it more expensive to raise that bird. And as a result, the price goes up just a tick. And, and in my neck of the woods, the difference between, you know, raising a thousand birds or raising 400 could be 50 cents on your, on your retail price. And, you know, some degree I'm okay with that. We'll look to see where we go next year. I got some ideas working uh, with my, uh, and I need to, you know, sit down and plan with my wife for what happens in 2018. Um, but, Getting back to what I raised this year, the, I raised this really cool bird called a Cobb Sasu, uh, slow-growing broiler that I got from So Big Farms in Texas. His name is John Christensen. Um, you can either look him up, So Big Farms, or you know, look in the show notes. I'll put a link to his to his hatchery. Uh, he he's an APA member. He called me a couple times throughout the year, and uh, I finally did a did a batch of birds. These guys raised grew out to about three nine. 3.9 pounds in 10 weeks. Um, for me, that was about a week slower than the Freedom Rangers. And then, of course, about three weeks slower than than what I could do a, a Cornish cross in. But, you know, the and the birds were, were you know, quote unquote, more active. They were, uh, they did graze well. They were a relatively easy bird to raise. I, I had zero mortality in the brooder um, up until the very last day or two and i think i took some crowding some piling in there so i I ended up with coming out of the brooder with with one or two losses uh i did have some predation out on pasture i was because of my housing style i had 100 birds in that batch and i actually raised them in a in a, a single house but i let them range so i had them inside netting but i moved the house every day and closed them up at night sometimes i let them out in the morning Everybody's good. I go back in midday and I got a, I got one dead. So I either took a, a hawk or an owl there at, at, at uh, first light. So I had some predation. They weren't the sharpest tool for, for predation, you know, which is nothing new if you're, if you're um, used to Cornish cross, you know, John tells me that, that they are, they have been good at his place for, for predation. But um, that all aside, these were hands down the best broiler that I've ever eaten. Um, I just, I don't know how else to say it. I'm going to write up 
the story a little bit here in the app of grit that's going to go in in um oh september so september october issue I'll, I'll write a little bit more about these birds but for now they were simply the juiciest the they were tender and they had a texture unlike any chicken that i've ever ever had in my entire life these so i can't i can't even describe it the the, the best word i have for it is kind of gross and unless you you know unless you can think like me but you know, it's kind of hard right so if you think if you take the texture of pudding you know you have that rich creamy texture of pudding and that's the texture of these broilers in the best as i can describe it is, is that texture of meat but juicy the wing or the the legs and thighs were absolutely flavorful more flavor than the breasts that's uh, not that's kind of expected right we know that from just about anything else but hands down best things now john is a breeder so he's breeding these birds in on farm in texas and and hatching selling eggs or selling day olds all across the country and you know what else what else can i say they, they came out of france so these are french genetic birds these they're bought from cob they're they're a cob sausage broiler um naked necks so they don't they look kind of strange but really adorable when they're <laughs> when they're young but as they grow you know they get a little bit ugly but uh still taste delicious like i said best best broiler i could have possibly ever eaten so that's where i've been it's been a little bit of a mishmash as far as as that goes but as we as we look around here i, I wanted to i, I want to talk to you about how i came to this very point in my life this sort of gave me an opportunity to talk about my story just a little bit in, in the last 10 minutes or so here um and if you oblige me, I, I appreciate it. You know, on this show, I do try to mix that story with the how-to. And I got to thinking about this in particular when I did an interview with Matt Breckwald of Off the Farm Podcast. That was episode 249. So if you want to go, I'll, I'll link his show in the show notes. But Matt, Matt was a cool cat. I like his podcast. Um, I recommend you take a listen to it. Uh, if, you, if you listen, pop over to his Facebook page. Just give him a comment. Tell him that you heard about him. Finally, on Mike's podcast, um, I did share the episode in in the, the Facebook group, but he got me thinking about my life. <laughs> he wanted to talk about mobile poultry processing because that's one of his guests referred me in that context. But I had already, I mean, this is my second year not actively doing mobile processing, um, which I still think was a very good decision. So uh, anyway, but he got me thinking about, about where I've come from and and how basically pastured poultry set me free you know that and i think that's the same thought that we have so that so many of you out there have you're sitting there in a cubicle 9 to 5 you're driving an hour a day you're working for people for things you don't really care about you know i get it that's you know w when i was younger i'll go all the way back to when i was a, a wee lad um in in junior high and into high school, I worked on a farm. I had a summer job. One of our jobs was, I, you know, I hoed weeds. I picked tomatoes. I picked peppers. I picked strawberries. I did general farm chores when, when none of that stuff was in season. We had the farm I worked at had an on-farm on processing facility to grade those peppers and tomatoes. And they brought product in from, from neighboring farms and did the same thing, packed it, got it out to market. But one of the things that sticks in my mind the most is they had a double decker chicken house. And when, when the, the owner was trying to give me some work to do, and one of the things he would have me do is walk through that barn, picking up dead chicken um, out of the litter. And uh, it was so nasty. I wanted nothing to do with chicken, you know, and I had heard at that point uh, about some alternative chicken stuff. You know, this was uh, this would have been basically the nineties early early 90, 91, 92, 89, right in that span. Um, about the time Joel Salatin was making waves, right? The lunatic in, in Virginia. And he was spreading that message. And I actually talked with Joel for the App of Grit episode 100. Anyway, so after I graduated high school, went to the Navy, did four years, um, came out, got a job with a company called Mindspring, working tech support, moved to Dallas, Texas, worked in... Uh, you know, we merged with Earthlink there. I ran the the call center in Texas. I moved back to Raleigh, which I'd never been before, but you know, hey, sounded good at the time, right? 
some more high tech stuff, got laid off, decided to move back home to, to Pennsylvania, eventually found myself in college, got a degree, technical writing. I'm, I'm skipping all the boring stuff, right? But giving you my path and that, that job, that college degree ultimately led to a, a, a job with a marketing agency as an account executive. And I, I did that for five years. You know, basically our job there was to work with clients from all kinds of different, um, all kinds of different industries, banking, modular construction, regular construction, healthcare, you know, you name it, manufacturing. We had a lot of manufacturing clients and build marketing for them because, you know, companies, part of their downsizing, the first to get the ax is usually the marketing people. So, but they still need marketing. So they hire agencies for creative and for to outsource that. So we, that's what we did. And I had a client load and I'd visit people all the time. You know, one of my favorite clients did Reamers, uh, which was kind of a, <laughs> a ho-hum product, but good, good local company here in Pennsylvania and did a lot of great things. Um, my, my point is did marketing understood a piece of how that marketing worked. You know, the, the rest of the history, the, the technical portion, um, taught me to think about how things work to troubleshoot. You know, that's really where I learned how to troubleshoot was in the Navy and, and, in in through my following eight, nine years as, um, working in the high tech space is learning how to troubleshoot, solve problems, think differently. And that transition then of, of the college into marketing was really solidifying the writing part of it and then moving into marketing and understanding how that all fits together. So being able to marry, um, the technology, the writing, the marketing, and now the last 10 years, well, not quite 10 years actually, but coming up there pretty soon, um, being able to marry that with the, the poultry, the pasture poultry specifically has been just an awesome thing to see in my life, how that, those intersections all can come together. And I, and I use that stuff just about every single day when I'm in my work. Um, you know, even though I've left things behind in, in the job world, those skills are still traveling with me and they're still forming an important basis of who I am and how I'm able to, to get around and, and function in life. So pasture poultry set me free. I re, we raised our first chickens. My wife and I bought uh, day-old chicks in the spring, early summer, I guess you would probably say. In 2008, they were speckled Sussex. Uh, we just had a half a dozen to... 10 or so, um, you know, we, we came, we came to this chicken journey basically because of the birth of our son. You know, he was born, we were living in a little, even though I was a country boy, I had, we were living in town at the time for a couple of years. And then my, we got pregnant and we needed a bigger house. So the house we found had some land and I'd call it more of a homestead these days rather than a farm, but gen, you know, uh, I, you never know about those definitions. You know, we generate income off of our property for sure. And, um, uh, but anyway, small, small acreage, but we wanted to, to, to give Cameron a place where he could experience food, you know, the living, breathing piece of food and understand that chickens come from, you know, a farm, his farm, his backyard, um, that kind of thing. And to this day, I don't know that he knows that you can go to a grocery store and buy it. I just don't, I don't think that even crosses his mind and that's awesome. But he was the, he was the driving force to get our chickens. And actually our first animal was pigs followed quickly by the chickens. Um, you know, 2009, we started with broilers. We launched an MPU in 2011, which was, um, just, just prior or just slightly after I came to work with APA and, and started publishing the APA newsletter, which is bi-monthly 28 page publication. In that point, when we started the MPU, that was really, my wife was laid off. I was working. We started that MPU because we were going to do farmer's markets. We wanted to get into the direct marketing farmer market slog and just go out there and, you know, give our, give our life away to us to Saturdays. Um, turned out to do that, we wanted to buy some processing equipment and instead of just buying it, setting it up and doing the farmer's market, we bought the processing equipment turned it into a business and that took over for the, the next five years. And that was a greater education than any, any you know, equivalent day at the market would have ever, ever been uh, learned so much about, you know, the, the, the local production of, of pasture poultry and, and the people in my, 
my neighborhood, my state, Pennsylvania, doing pasture poultry and, and saw a lot of things worked, saw a lot of things that didn't work, was able to process it all and just kind of, you know, build a really successful business. We it it backed down a little bit because we realized at one point in time that, you know, we didn't necessarily like processing chickens every day, especially in the heat of the, of August. So we we discontinued that service. Nobody's taken it up again. There's still the opportunity and Pennsylvania's regulations have kind of been a little bit tougher uh recently since then when we first started um it was pretty wide open when we first started in 2011 but anyway at one point my wife went back to work and then in the spring of 2013 i was able to leave my corporate job you know i left my corporate job at that point to run them the mobile unit to do some chicken production and to to work with appa so those were the kind of the and i and i set up a an equipment sales dealership to that i thought would play heavily on on the the MPU, but it didn't, you know, it didn't quite work out that way. But so those were the pieces that fit my life together all around poultry. Um, pretty much a, a, a well-rounded perspective of it. And, and in, in those years, 13, 14, um, even into 15, you know, we, we did 500 to a thousand birds those years. Did a lot of, we did a lot of the chefs. We did a lot of, you know, bulk sales to, to, you know, people, and we did some different sales models, but as I mentioned earlier, we just kind of allowed that business to to drop and and use natural filters um, to to really get to the 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 core customers that we have. And and you know some of my customers have actually dropped out and started raising their own chicken. So you know I can't complain about that. That's that's pretty awesome too. But um, but then at some point, you know, be about. 2015, 2014, I guess maybe it was 2014. My wife left her job again, and then she went trained as a IOIA organic inspector, and that's been her life. She's been an independent contractor um, now for the last several years, out traveling in Pennsylvania, New York, as, as auditing organic farms. And you know, we can we'll we'll talk more about organic stuff later but you know she's obviously involved with lots of different organic not just the poultry which she does do um so so we've operated successfully profitably in that range that so many of you are especially when you're starting in that 500 to a thousand bird range it's possible i love that business model i think it it works well for for people of small acreages like like myself for people who want to just transition into um pasture poultry but it is pastured poultry that set me free, that set my wife free. So now we're both independent contractors, essentially. You know, I don't, you know, I'm, I work with APA or for APA, but I'm an independent contractor. You know, it, it's, APA doesn't have employees. They have me and a board. <laughs> um, I do draw some money from that, but you know, so that's a part of, of my life, but it all hinges on pastured poultry and, I think that's great. And that's one of the things I always talk about, not always, but I, I talk about frequently on this show is the idea that there's more ways to, to operate and be successful with pasture poultry other than, other than, let me say this, other than raising birds. Raising birds is one of the easiest things you can do. I guarantee you, anybody who's listening to my voice right now can go out and get 25 birds, not know anything, and probably bring 20 of those birds to market, to, to processing day. Will they be the best birds? No. Will they be the most efficient birds? Probably not. Will they? Will you be able to sell them? Who knows, right? But the production piece of our of our life is is really the simplest. It's the business part. It's the marketing part. It's the processing part. It's the will. <laughs> it's the it's the ability to to not stagnate or the desire not to be stagnant, right? There, I think there's a there's a complacency that sometimes falls over us when we get to a certain level and. And we're like, oh, we got it. We don't need any more help. And that's not true. Um, and if you're an APA member and you read your issue 100, you'll see that very clearly. Um, those, those 20, 30 year producers still producing, still changing, still adapting and still going strong. You know, that's, that's where I hope to be in the next 10 years is somebody, you know, looking back and reflecting over the last 20 years of my life in pastured poultry and, you know, off to a good start for that so far. We're just about the halfway point there. But my but pasture poultry is the driving force. It is it is the change agent. It is the difference maker in so many lives, in so many communities, in so many families. And that's where 
I want to set your vision. Pasture poultry as a difference maker, as a as that catalyst to change. And I think if we get serious about that, if we get more people can who raising their own, whether you know whether you've, you're the the 200, 300 sort, or whether you're the 20 or 40,000 sort, or the 70,000 sort, or, or, you know, that kind of thing. There's a continuum of, of opportunity there across a lot of different niches. And it's, it, it shows like mine, but not, not exclusively. It's organizations like APA. It's, it's you out there in your regions and your localities, cooperating with people and bringing people together studying, learning, being transparent, working together. That's the cohesion that we need, that collaboration. Got lots more to talk about on those specific points as we go through the next month or two. Um, you're going to hear it come back again and we're going to bring in APA more. You know, I can't help but bring my work with APA in. Even though APA doesn't sponsor this podcast, they're not, you know, we're, we're separate. We're tied together by Mike, right? But, but my work there so informs this work and it's really my unfair advantage when it comes to this podcast is, you know, without APA, I just wouldn't be half of where I am. I mean, I, that's just an undeniable. And, and so many people on the producer side can say the same thing. APA literally is the, the catalyst for their success, not just because of what we do, but a lot of times because who they meet, um, the relationships that they build, the, the community that they're able to to connect into and, and collaborate with. And then the details come, the production details come. So that's my story. Pasture poultry set me free. Everybody has freedom. Everybody has that, that perspective. What's it look like for you? I'd like to tell, I'd like to hear how pasture poultry is setting you free by going to pasture poultry talk on Facebook, make a course to join the group and then sound off. Let us know love to continue this conversation but for now let's look ahead upcoming episodes we got nick stolberg from new roots haiti we got paul Gree from pasture bird good mike rothrock he's a usda scientist yeah you're gonna love that one i love that episode you're gonna love hearing from dave and ginger shields from pasture life farm out in florida all appa members all every single one of them all doing something slightly interesting or slightly different highly interesting in the pasture poultry space um, love all of those guys and girls, uh, of course, Ginger, and um, can't wait to, to bring you those shows. And then we're looking for the next group after that, and we're we're ready to go. Head over to Facebook, Pasture Poultry Talk, give me your recommendations. And uh, until you hear my sound again, thank you, thank you very much.